wanted to be able to use Thunderbird and GNU PG together with Tor. And so we thought, oh, it would be really easy, I bet, to configure Thunderbird to work with Tor. Ha! And a new free software project was born. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's a really simple thing, but basically it's just a package uh, that hooks it all together. So a lot of people were using Thunderbird and Torbirdie and GNU PG and Tor and Debian uh, together for email, uh, combined with RiseUp uh, as an email service. So it's, uh, I mean, really, literally, it's a real peer-to-peer, -peer free software-driven set of things, actually, that made it possible. So one thing I never understood about this process was exactly how the documents were handled. And maybe that's because nobody wants to say. Mm. But, you know, who would, did you leave them on a server somewhere and download them and hand them over to people? And who took what where? And, and how do you do, you know, in case I need to do something really dangerous with a load of documents, what's the best way of doing it? <laughs> <clears throat> mm. <laughs> Good thing well, this isn't um, streamed. If, it, I'm sorry, what? Someone, there was a voice from God. What did she say? I said, good thing oh. we're in streaming tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, hello to all of our friends in uh, domestic and international surveillance services. Um, well, so I won't answer your question, but since you asked a question, it's my turn to talk. So, what I would say is that if you want to do clandestine activities that you fear for your life for, you need to really think about the situation that you're in very carefully. And so a big part of this is operational security, and a big part of that is compartmentalization. So certain people had access to certain things, but maybe they couldn't decrypt them. And certain things were moved around, and that's on a need-to-know basis, and those people who knew, which is not me, I don't know anything, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, <laughs> Those people knew, and then, you know, it'll go with them to their grave. So if you're interested in being the next Edward Snowden, you need to do your homework on finding people that will be able to do the, do the other part of it, let's say. Um, but just in general, I mean, compartmentalization is key, right? So it's not just for app armor profiles. And so you need to um, think about what you want to do. And I mean, a big part of this is to consider that the network itself is kind of the enemy, even though it is useful for communicating. So all the metadata that exists on the network could have tipped people off, could have caused this whole thing to fall apart. And I mean, it really is amazing. I feel like, you know, two and a half, three years ago, when you talk about free software and you talk about the idea of free software and you talk about issues relating to autonomy and privacy and security, you have a really different reception now than you did then. And that's really what it took to turn the world like half a degree or something or a quarter of a degree or something. Um, so sorry, I'm not gonna tell you about uh, detailed plans for conspiracy, but I highly encourage you to read about South African history, and particularly the history of Umkanto Wee Sizwi. They were the um, sort of clandestine communications group for MK, or the, rather the Operation Vula inside of MK, which is Umkanto Wee Sizwi, and they are sort of with the African National Congress. And those people have published so many books about the revolutionary activities to overthrow the apartheid state, if you read these books, uh, especially the book Operation Vula and Armed and Dangerous by Ronnie Kasrilis, um, they give you some idea about what you need to do, which is how to compartmentalize, how to find people to do very specific tasks, how to work on building trust with each other, what that looks like, how to identify political targets, how you might use things like communications technology to sort of change the political topic on and it's just the sort of discussion in general. And I mean, I think that the best way to learn about those things is really to study previous people who've tried to do that kind of stuff. Um, and the NSA is not the apartheid regime of South Africa, but there's still lessons to be learned there. And so if you really want to know the answer to that, you know, also Che Guevara's manual on guerrilla warfare is very interesting. And there's a lot of other books that are like that. I'd be happy to talk about it with you later. And they have nothing to do with anything that we may or may not have done. <laughs> and do you think at the... Sorry. Do, you, do you think is there a sh chance that things may get better? For example, I know that publicly some programs were not extended, but I don't know what is happening in the background, so maybe it's the same thing, but they are pretending not, or that it's not. How do you see this? Well, I think uh, a couple of things. Um, in general, I think that what happened, not just with this movie, but with all of these things, is that it inspired hope. 
And hope is very important, but hope is not a strategy for survival or for building alternatives. So what it has also done is allowed us to raise the profile on the things that actually do make it better. So for example, ridding ourselves of the chains of proprietary software is something that's a serious discussion with some people that previously wouldn't have talked about free software because they don't care about liberty, they care about security. And even though I think those are really similar things, previously they just thought we were free software hippies in tie-dyed shirts. And while that may be true on the weekends and in evenings or with B-Dale every day, um, <laughs> Um, I think that actually does make it better. And it also changes the dialogue in the sense that it's no longer reasonable to pretend that mass surveillance and surveillance issues don't matter, right? Because if you really go down the rabbit hole of thinking about what some of the security services are trying to do, it becomes obvious that we want to encrypt everything all the time to beat selector-based surveillance and dragnet surveillance. It doesn't matter if something is authenticated. You could still trigger some action to take place with these kinds of surveillance machines that could then for example, drone strike someone. And so it raises that, and that gives me a lot of hope too, because now people understand sort of the root of the problem, or the root of many problems, and the root of some violence in the world, actually. So it helps us to reduce that violence by getting people to acknowledge that it's real, and also that they care about it, and that we care about each other. So that really gives me a lot of hope. And part of that is Snowden, and part of that is the documents. But the other part of it is that, you know, we. I don't, I, I don't want to like blow it up and make it sound like we're, you know, like we did something really like a big deal, but in a sense, you know, Laura, Glenn, myself, and a number of other people were really not sure we would ever be able to travel home to our country, that we wouldn't be arrested. I actually haven't been home in over two and a half years, basically, well, two, two years and three months or something, right? I went on a small business trip that lasted, supposed to last two weeks, and then this happened, and I've been here ever since. It's a really long, crazy trip, but the point is that that that's what was necessary to make some of these changes, I think. And eventually, I think it will turn around. I'll be able to go home. Laura and Glenn are able to travel to the US again. Obviously, you know, Julian is still stuck in the Ecuadorian embassy. Sarah lives in exile in Berlin. I live in exile in Berlin. And Ed is in Moscow. So we're not finished with some of these things. Um, and it's also possible that we are, the, the, the set of people I mentioned, that the state that we are in will actually stay that way forever. But what matters is that the rest of the world can actually move on and fix some of these problems. And that, I have a lot of hope about that. And I see a lot of change. And that's the really big part. Like the reproducible build stuff that Holger and, and, and Luna are working on, people really understand the root reason for needing to do that. And it actually seems quite reasonable to people who previously would have expended energy against it. And now they're in support of it. So that, I think, is really good. And there's a lot of other hopeful things. So I, I would try to be as uplifting as possible, and it's not just the rum. So um, near the end of the film, we saw something about another source. Um, I may have been missing some news or something, but mm. I don't remember anything about that being public. Do you know what happened to that? As far as I know, any other source that was mentioned in the film is still anonymous, and they're still free. I'm not exactly sure because I was not involved in that part, but I also saw the end of the film and I've seen a bunch of other reporting which wasn't attributed to anyone in particular. So the good news, I mean, there's an old slogan from, um, from the Dutch hacker community, right? Someone you trust is one of us and the leak is higher up in the chain of command than you. And I feel like that might be true again. So hopefully. I think that guy has a question as well. Oh. Yeah, so... Um Part of the, the problem initially was that encryption and software was actually not so easy to use, right? And I think part of the challenge to everyone was to actually improve on that situation and mm -hmm. to make it better. Yeah. So I'm asking you if you've observed any change and to the rest of us in the room, well, have we done anything to improve on that? Uh, so, I, I mean, I definitely think that there is a lot of free software that makes encryption easier to use though not always on free platforms, which really is heartbreaking. For example, Moxie Marlin Spike um, has done a really good job with Signal, Text Secure, and Redphone of making end-to-end -end encrypted calling, texting, sexting, and whatever apps. <laughs> Sex Secure, I think, is what it's nicknamed. And um, I'm very impressed by that. I mean, it works really well. And that is something which, especially in the last two years, you know, if you have a cell phone, which I don't recommend, but if you do have a cell phone and you put in everyone's phone number, a lot of people that I would actually classify as non-technical people that don't care about free software as a, as a hobby or as a passion or as a profession, you see their names in those systems often more than some of the free software people. And that's really impressive to me. And I think there's been a huge shift just generally about those things, also about so, sort of social responsibility, where people understand they have a responsibility to other people to encrypt 
communications and not to like put people in harm's way by saying unsafe stuff over unsafe communication lines. Um, so I think there's like been, uh, in my personal view, it's been better. But the original problem wasn't actually that the encryption was hard to use. I think the main problem is people didn't understand the reason that it needed to be done. And they believed the lie that is targeted versus mass surveillance. And there's a big lie. And the lie is that there is such a thing really as targeted surveillance. In the modern era, most so-called targeted surveillance actually happens through mass surveillance. They gather everything up and then they look through the thing they've already seized. Um, and then, of course, there are targeted focused attacks, um, but the main thing is that uh, the abuse of surveillance often happens on an individual basis. It also has a societal cost. And I think a lot of people really understand that. And it's, it's probably because I also live in Germany now for the last two years, but I feel that German society in particular is extremely aware of these uh, abuses in the modern world, and they have a historical context that allows them to talk about it with the rest of the world where the world doesn't downplay it. So this is how other people relate to Germany, not just about how Germans relate with each other. And that has also been really good for just meeting regular people who really care about it and who really want to do things. So like people's parents email me, like I want to protect my children. What's the best way to use crypto with them? You know, things like that. And they, you know, I didn't ever receive emails like that in the past. And that's, I mean, that to me really is uplifting and very positive, so. so just a quick organizational question. So right now we're live streaming the Q&A. Are you comfortable with that? So just you know, or should we? Uh, I don't think that in the last three years I've ever had a moment that wasn't being recorded. Okay, so. I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> just, just so you know, yeah. Um, if, if you're fine with it, you're really gonna. It's fine. Just don't do it when I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> So I was wondering uh, why uh, Laura and you ended up in, in Germany because uh, what you said about uh, peoples in Germany might be true, but I'm really ashamed about my government, uh, how they deal with uh, hmm. uh, spying the chancellor and, and anything. There's, they are doing nothing for this. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, so the reason that we ended up in Germany is because mm -hmm. I've been attending KS Computer Club events for many years. And there are a bunch of people that are a part of the Chaos Computer Club who are really supportive and good people who have a stable base and infrastructure. And you know, in the German hacker scene in particular has this uh, phenomenon, which is a par it's a part of society. So there are people in the CCC who will talk with the you know constitutional court, for example, and that creates actually a much more stable civil society. And those people were willing to help us. They were willing to hold footage, hold encrypted data. They were willing to help like modify hardware. I mean, there was a huge base of support where people, even if they had fear, they did, they did stuff anyway. And that support went back a long time. And so we knew that it would be safe to store footage for the film here in Berlin, not here in Heidelberg, but here in Germany. And we knew that, of course, there were people that would really, that would be helpful, right? In the US, there's a much bigger culture of fear where people are afraid of being, having their houses raided by the police, where there's lots of detainments at borders, uh, like speculative arrests, journalists that are jailed. You know, so the, this, the situation was not to say that Germany is perfect. I mean, I, I revealed in Der Spiegel with three other journalists that Merkel was spied on by the NSA. And it's very clear that the German government is complicit with some of this surveillance. But in a sort of like pyramid of surveillance, there's a kind of colonialism that takes place. And at the NSA and the GCHQ are sort of at the top. And the Germans are a little bit below that. There isn't, and the thing is that there's not a lot you can do about that. And so even though we revealed this about Merkel, it's not clear what she should do. It's not clear what anyone should do. But one thing that was clear is that if they wanted to break into our houses, they would do it in a way that would cost them very, like a lot politically. It would be very public, right? The last time that someone raided someone working with Der Spiegel was in 1962 during the Spiegel affair and some ministers were kicked out. You may have seen recently the Landesfahrt thing with Netzpolitik. I mean, the charges now against them have been dropped. That would never happen in the United States. We would not be safe, right? And I still, for my investigative journalism and my work with WikiLeaks and my work with the Tor Project, I just won't, I won't even go back to the US because there's no chance that if they wanted to do something to me that I would have any constitutional liberties, I think. And the same is true with Snowden, right? You just won't get that fair trial. And we thought at least here, we would have ground to stand and fight on. And it's exactly what happened and we won. Uh, right, yeah. This is also about the fear stuff that you talk about, which is in the very old days we used to put sort of um, red words at the end of every message to so make sure that it would be hard to find the actual subversive messages among all the noise. Mm. And you can think about the same thing here, right? Should we build our system so that everything gets encrypted all the time? 
Yeah. So that there's noise. Let's, you know. I mean, I have a lot of radical suggestions for what to do, but I'm going to talk about them tomorrow in the keynote mostly. But to give you an example, when you install Debian, you can give someone the ability to log into the machine over a Tor hidden service for free. You get a free .onion when you, you know, add two lines to a Tor configuration file. We should make encryption not only easy to use, but out of the box, we should make it possible to have end-to-end -end reachability and connectivity. And we should reduce the total amount of metadata to make it harder for people that want to break the law, that want to break into computers. We should solve the problem of you know, adversarial versus non-adversarial forensics so we can verify our systems with open, and, and open hardware and free software together. And there's a lot to be done, but the, the main thing to do is to recognize that if you will have the ability to upload to Debian, there are literally intelligence agencies that would like those keys. And we have a great responsibility to humanity as Debian developers to do the right thing, to build open systems, and to build them in a way where users don't need to understand this stuff. There are a lot of people in the world that will never see this film. And we can solve the problems that this film describes, largely with free software. And we can do that without them knowing, and they will be safe for us having done that. And if we can do that, the world will be a better place. I think. And in fact, I think the world is a better place because of the efforts that were already done in that area that made this possible. Right? The Tails project made it so that a bunch of people who are good at investigative journalism, but absolutely terrible with computers, were able to pull this off. And that is entirely the product, in my opinion, of free software. Um, and a little, bit, a little bit, Laura and Glenn, but I would say a lot free software. So. How many people do you think NSA has working within the Debian community? <laughs> well, I looked in the Snowden archive about that, actually. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, as far as I can tell, Debian is not a high priority target for them. I mean, they, they write exploits for all sorts of stuff, but I never found any systematic attempt to compromise or to harm the Debian project. But obviously there are people that are paid by the NSA to infiltrate communities, and that's why we have to have open, transparent processes so that if those people behave badly, we have an audit trail. Like, we won't actually ever stop that kind of stuff, but what matters is that people do good things. It doesn't matter who they do bad things for as long as we can correct those things and or catch them and stop them before it happens. But as far as I know, there are only a couple of people that have ever been associated with the NSA and the Debian community. Um, but I, I think we shouldn't get paranoid about it. We should just be prudent about our processes because there are lots of intelligence services around the world that do not like the values of a universal operating system. So I think, you know, it's not super important to look, but I did actually look very specifically for a whole bunch of people in the Debian community to see if any of them also were being paid by the NSA, and I didn't find any serious thing that raised concern. And if, if I did, I would have, I mean, there were lots of things that I found in the archive that I immediately notified security teams about and where I, I worked to, along with many other people, to actually try to fix those things. And one of those things, if we had found them, like infiltrators in Debian, I absolutely would have just told people about it. The problem is that the, a lot of other journalists don't want to do that because there's a 10-year felony where you go to prison, a federal American prison, for 10 years if you reveal the name of an agent. So there's a tension there. But I think that there's something to be said. If they're actually actively harming the community and they're committing a crime, I think there's something to be said about that. So if I found that, I think it would be worthwhile. But just so you know, there's this high cost. So if there were people in the agency now, because they saw that we used Tails and Debian, and they wanted to subvert it, there's a really, really high bar for punishment, uh, which suggests that maybe people won't tell you. So we need to sort of bank on the fact that we'll never know, but that we don't need to know, as long as we have good processes that would catch bad behavior. And that's, that's one of the strengths of Debian. There are very few operating systems, I think, and just in general free software communities that are as diverse and committed to the openness and the free software nature of this, like, this kind of a project. And so it's very important to stay to that. Um, but I do, I do think one of the things that will happen in the future at some point is you'll start to find people in the Debian community that are pressured by other people to do bad things. So we need to set up processes that will stop that to create an incentive for that not happening. Um, but it's, I mean, it's really tough. Um, so I think openness, transparency, and accountability are the ways that we actually can combat that, because otherwise we won't really be able to solve it. But don't be paranoid is the other thing. They really are out to get you, so be prepared. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Hi. I'm just wondering uh, how trust was established because uh, I've, I've just realized in this community for you to verify your public key and even fingerprint is like you have to produce your passport. So I'm wondering how Laura money to like exchange their keys with Snowden and ensure that uh, they were really talking to the right persons. Well, they, they had a, a whole like sort of dance for doing key exchange. And I think, you know, it was a little bit luck and a little bit transitive trust. It was a little bit of the web of trust. And uh, it worked pretty well. I mean, I don't think that the key signing stuff that Debian does is anything close to what they were doing. They just wanted to make sure that the keys that they had had were the right keys and that they weren't compromised and that then they would change things. So there was a point in the movie where they said, you know, let's, let's disassoci disassociate our metadata one more time. And what that means is they changed all of the identifiers that are visible to the network. So new keys, new email addresses, whatever, new Tor circuit, et cetera. Um, and, you know, this is kind of like a key consistency thing where they had the right key to begin with and they continue to rotate over new keys. Uh, this is also sometimes called tofu. This is, I think, weaker than the web of trust, but a lot easier for people to do and very easy to explain. And it worked out pretty well. It doesn't like scale really well, but it has a separate sort of good side, which is the web of trust explicitly names a web of co-conspirators. And so you kind of don't want that feature. It's, the, it's useful for something like Debian. It's not useful for clandestine conspiracies to commit investigative journalism. <laughs> wow, now there are lots of questions. This is great. Uh, somebody working uh, on Tails told me that the NSA has a file on every uh, DD. Is that true? Do you, do you know even? Okay, so um, when you balance your checkbook, just to answer your question in a really strange way, when you balance your checkbook or you balance your bank account and you think like, this is how much my rent is, this is how much food is, this is how much I have to spend on some new hardware, you know, you think about money in like an individual way. But if you think about it as a state, the way that a state thinks about money is not, they don't balance budgets the same way that you do. They think about long-term investments very differently, they have other people's money, it's a whole different way of managing it. And the NSA, uh, is not the Stasi. So it's not that you need to worry about them having a file on you or on every Debian developer, but rather there exist some laws in the United States that say for cybersecurity purposes, you don't have constitutional rights. And based on your accent, you weren't in America anyway, and you're not in America, so you don't have any rights at all anyway, according to them. They're just allowed to do whatever they want to you, up to and including murdering you with the CIA. That's what they do with drones. That was at the very end of the movie. Um, so it's not that they have a file on you. It's that they have giant databases full of information on all of us, and then they, when they're interested in you, pull up all your data and the associative data, and then they use that. And sometimes they use it to target you, to break into your machines, or to find people to assert pressure on, or to do psychological manipulation, all that stuff. Um, they do all of those things. And so it's not that they have one file on you, though maybe, depends, if you work on a critical package like the Linux kernel, they might be more interested in you than if you work on something, I don't know, something, something else. I mean. I don't want to denigrate anyone's work, but they have like very specific focuses. And so they definitely are interested in being able to compromise systems, right? And, and so it's not, you know, you may also have a file, but it's really the, the meta list is the new way of thinking about it. And in some senses, I think that's actually scarier because they just hoover up everything all across the whole internet and things that are interesting, then they have them. And depending on what interesting things are there, they maybe put those in a database that lasts forever, or maybe it's just around for 30 days, or maybe it's full content for nine days or something like that. And then, of course, if you are a person of interest, they, of course, do do the same stuff that the Stasi does. They do that Zersetzung stuff, if you're familiar with this German term, disintegration. Um, they do that kind of stuff along with JTRIG from GCHQ. So they like harass people, blackmail them, do all sorts of really nasty stuff. Um, and they do that also, so it's both of those things. Um, but again, I don't think you should be paranoid. You should encrypt your stuff and help people to do the same and know that in a democratic society with a secret political police, the right place to be is in their database, right? You should be proud of being surveilled by them. That means you're doing the right thing. <laughs> Nonetheless, we should stop them also. Um, I'm curious about your views about Stone, Snow, Snowden um, actually coming out and saying he was a whistleblower. Because I know when he came out, I had some fierce discussion with friends about it. So 
wanted to know what you thought about it. What do you mean came out like that he... Uh, he said, I I'm Ben Snowden, I'm the whistleblower, here I am. Instead of just being anonymous the whole way and just sending files to people. Um, well, I think the main thing is that it's about control of your own narrative, right? I mean, if we could have done everything here anonymous and gotten away with it, would that have made the same impact in getting other people to come forward, even if they maintained their anonymity? So I think that what Snowden did, what's beautiful about it, is that he basically did enough where he could then survive. Our job now, for the most part, a very good friend of mine told me, uh, he, 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 he's a little bit of a fatalist, but he said, your job, Laura's job, Glenn's job, Snowden's job, your job now is just to survive. That's all that you need to do now. You don't need to do anything else. You should go do other things, but like, you know, drink a glass of wine, relax, be happy, have a nice life, but just survive so that other people can see that you can do the right thing, and even though you could have done more, you did enough, and you lived through it. And so Snowden coming out and telling us all of these things, I mean, you had really powerful people saying he should be assassinated, right? Hung by the neck until dead was what one of the CIA people said. So he probably could have continued to be anonymous for a while, but imagine if the NSA had got to reveal his identity. How would that have been framed? What would the first impression have been uh, I think they called him a narcissist, and they called him all these terrible names. And it didn't really stick, because he basically said, come, up, come at me, bro. I'm ready. And uh, you can do your worst, but you can't get rid of the facts. So let's talk about the facts. And I think the timing of how he did that is good, because people really cared about the issues. But then he also recognized that it was a matter of time. The, the NSA police went to his house. You know, they really bothered his family. Uh, they've done that with my family as well. Other people's families have had trouble. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's tough because I think he probably would have liked to have been able to not have that happen. But there comes a point in which you're the person that has access to all that information and they're going to figure it out. No amount of anonymity, I think, will last forever, but it can buy you time. And he got exactly the amount of time he needed. Um, the really sad part about him coming out in public when he did, though, was that he got stuck in Russia because my government canceled his passport, I think mostly for propaganda reasons. Because in the United States, um, we denigrate all things relating to Russia. And there are lots of problems with Russia, and especially with Vladimir Putin. But at the same time, there, that seems to be the only country that was willing to uphold his fundamental liberties. Right? I went to the Council of Europe and to the European Parliament, to the German Parliament, to the French sort of to the French parliament, they didn't really want to meet with me, but uh, also to the Austrian parliament and to a number of other places. And uh, everyone said, oh, we would really love to help anybody who needs help. Oh, it's Edward Snowden, never mind. <laughs> and so, while I have a lot of critiques on Russia, the propaganda aspect of it was very damaging for him to be stuck in Russia, but on the other hand, he's still alive and he's still mostly free. Um, and they recognize his right to seek and to receive asylum. So there's a lot of trade-offs to think about identifying oneself. And if you were thinking about being the next Snowden or helping Snowden or someone, something like that, you, know, you really have to think this out many steps ahead. And it's easy to say, oh, he should have just stayed anonymous and no one would have ever figured it out. But that's very clearly not planning for the case where they do figure it out and then they're going to be in control of the narrative. And in that case, you, I think, are better off to do what he did. And I think he did so quite reluctantly. He's not an egoist or a narcissist. He's actually a really shy guy from what I can tell. And so um, I don't know exactly what conversation you and your friend had, but I would suspect that uh, the notion is that people are more powerful when anonymous. And that's true sometimes, but not always. And it's important to remember that anonymity technology is there, so you have a choice, not a requirement. And that choice is sometimes counterintuitive. But I think he did the right thing in this way. And I wish that my government had done right by him as well, but we did not. So there's a couple more questions. Uh, do you want to keep going on? Should we get in another club matter? Are you? I would. Um, I would love some of that rum. That oh, rum! Yeah. I think I have to say. Wait. What do I have to say? I have to say GR Sec, right? GR Sec Colonel, and then the rum appears. Rum is a service. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, and I'm really happy to keep taking questions because to me, what I want is every person in this room to really feel a part of this because you really are. A lot of the people that I've met in this community really inspired me to action. And it's important to understand that really it would not have been possible without Debian. For example, D-Bootstrap, very important tool, right? With Weasel's packaging of Tor, 
it allowed us to have bootstraps of things. It allowed us to build things. And using free software really was helpful. So if you guys have any questions at all, I mean, really, each and every person that helps with Debian should just know that you're a part of that. And I'm happy to talk for as long as you want, basically, to answer all of your questions, except the ones that put me in prison. Thanks. <laughs> Just wanted to make a quick note about the uh, have they uh, about the question: Do they have a file on me? Uh, what, uh, from all I, I've read so far, it's just that they are doing the thing which is in the commercial world called big data. Yeah, absolutely. Oh boy, GRSEC again, huh? <coughs> Martin. He's bringing the book. It's yeah. Not Ram, but it's the very with me. Oh boy. <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's going to be a heavy morning tomorrow. <laughs> All right, there's some more, there's another, I saw a couple other hands in the back, oh, in front, yeah, hi. I was just wondering if there's anything that you noticed throughout this that you'd think that we could improve in Debian to make the next people's lives easier? Or... Oh my god, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> That's so fantastic. Uh, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow in my keynote, but let me tell you one that I had. Uh, I revealed a specific document about a Wi-Fi injection attack system. Uh, it's a classified document. It's a top secret document for a thing called Nightstand. And what Nightstand is, is it's basically like Carmetasploit. It's a Wi-Fi injector. Wow. Cheers. And... Uh... <clears throat> Danke schön. Um, it's a Wi-Fi injector device. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> Tonight's whiskey is sponsored by drunktank.org. They just forged it. Oh, yeah. um, so this, this Wi-Fi injector device, what it does is it, it um, basically is able to exploit the kernel of a device by sending, say, malformed data over Wi-Fi. Now, I have a series of photographs. So all of us used uh, X60, not all of us, but most of us used these specially modified X60s where we remove the microphones, soldered down things on the PCI bus, we removed like firewire and all these different things. We really modified it, flash core boot onto it, flipped the read pin so it was only read only, so we couldn't easily make a BIOS rootkit and make it persistent. We booted tails, we did all this stuff. Often we would boot two RAM so that once the machine was powered off, you know, basically it would be done. And so if someone kicks down your door, you just pull the power out and you don't have a battery in and when the power fails, you have an instant kill switch. Um, so things that are in Tails that are really useful include this wiping the kernel memory package, which I hear is being packaged for Debian soon, which is very exciting because um, everyone should have access to that so we can tie it into something like GNU Panic D uh, or these other, uh, other things. Um, but one thing I kept having problems with is like, this Wi-Fi injection device, I'm pretty sure, was very close to my house. Like, there's a white van outside. It's kind of vibrating a little bit, like, because there's a guy walking around in it. And all of a sudden, an X60 here, an X60 here, and an X60 here, just booted into tail. It's not doing anything at all, but on a Wi-Fi network. Kernel panic, kernel panic, kernel panic. All the same kernel panic, all the same memory offsets in the Apple Talk driver of the stock kernel for Tails. I mean, I think I filed a bug with uh, upstream with, with Tails at the time, but this is just like incredible because it's clear that all the crap in the default Debian kernel that you really want for your 1992 Apple network makes operational security really hard. And one thing that would be really great would be a GRSEC enabled kernel that, <laughs> GR, yes, have to drink. Oh, and, and, at, but, but as an example, we built, some custom, so we built different custom machines, and one of the things that we did for some people and in some circumstances was to build GRSEC-enabled kernels. <laughs> and I'm not going to drink again. <laughs> uh. So we built those kernels. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, those ones. And, and that was work which um, creates a problem uh, for a bunch of reasons. When you build custom kernels, and you only have a few people that can build those kernels, you actually build a chain of evidence of who helped who. And if that was a stable, normal package that people could install in a, in a Debian pure blend, it would have been easier to do that. 
Um, we build a lot more sandbox profiles for various different things. Uh, we built some transparent torification stuff, and that required a lot of bespoke knowledge, and it required a lot of effort that a lot of people did not have because they had a different set of skills. And it's good to have a division of labor, but having that kind of stuff built in to Debian by default, making a Debian install that can do that, and also a verification would be great, right? So I wrote some custom scripts where I could look at a Tails disk or a Debian install and know if it had been tampered with. And it would be nice if there was just a verificate, like a disk you could boot that did verification of an installed system very, very easily. So easily that Glenn Greenwald could use it. And that's, <laughs> I'm, I love Glenn, and I say that very, very politely, but what I mean is it, it needs to be easier than that for everybody else. Because Glenn at least knows that he has a reason to do it. Um, and so that was something that we really needed help with. Um, and we spent a lot of time on that. Um, and there are lots of other little things like that, and I'll talk about some of those things tomorrow, but one of the really big problems is actually hardware, which is that you cannot buy a modern Intel CPU that doesn't come with a backdoor anymore. And that is a huge problem, and the, I'm not sure that the answer is to use ARM. It seems like the answer is to use ARM, but that's only if we assume that ARM just didn't add a backdoor that's obvious. And so we really need to think about how to, in moving forward, how to have easy to use, easy to buy on the shelf, Debian hardware available everywhere all the time, so you can just go and buy this thing and verify it in some way with some other machine to know that you have the right thing. And to that extent, we didn't have x-rays for a lot of the circuit boards, so that made it very difficult to know if when you buy something, if it's been tampered with. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of that, uh, also that stuff tomorrow, but basically, Debian does a lot of stuff right. And that is also worth mentioning. There's so many things that just work right out of the box, that just work perfectly. Um, so the main thing is to keep the quality assurance at the level or to exceed where it is right now because it actually works super, super well. The exception being for very specific targeted attacks, the kernel attack surface is pretty big and pretty bad, I think. And also, we rebuilt some binaries in order to, sorry, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. We, we rebuilt some binaries to make sure that we had address space randomization and linker hardening and like stack canary stuff. And for some things lately, we've been using address sanitizer. Um, so, I mean, it would be really great if all of the hardening stuff was turned on, if there was PAX plus GRSEC as a kernel. So the specific problem with GR security is they don't really want to work with they don't really want to work with distros. Um, so we could have a we could have a Linux kernel package with GR security applied, but it would be it wouldn't have any of the other any of the other Debian patches. So I talked with Brad Spender about this, and I'm so glad mm -hmm. that you said that because what he said is that he would, as far as I can tell, he's totally interested in helping Debian with this, but thinks that Debian is not interested. And he actually runs a kernel building service where they okay. do individual kernel builds. And I think you'd be interested. And when I told him we'd love to have this in Tails, he said, what patches do I need to include in GRSEC to make sure that it will work? And he offered okay. to do the integration into the GRSEC patch if there are not too many things. So I think what we should try to do is build a line of communication. And if it costs money, we should find a way to raise the money. I'll put in some of my own personal money for this. And I know other people would too. Great. So Secure Drop, for example, part of what they do for their leaking platform, if you go to the Intercepts website and you want to leak them a document, they actually use free software everywhere, but there are a few things that they build specially, and one of those things is a GRSEC kernel. So the people at first look that help make this movie and that, who work on Secure Drop, they would probably also, I'm not committing them, I don't actually know that they would do this, but I think they would really like it if that was in there. And if we can find the community will to do that, I know that I would volunteer and other people would. I know DKG in the back would love to help with this. I know the ACLU is just totally behind funding this work, right? I don't know. <laughs> I thought you were there to protect my civil liberties, buddy. <laughs> but I really think that, 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 there, that it's possible that we can do this. And um, I definitely think Brad would really, uh, the, the author of GRSEC, I think he'd really love it if Debian shipped GRSEC. And it doesn't need to come by default. But if it, no. if, it, if it was possible to just have it at all, that would be great. So maybe we can have an affinity group where everyone who's interested can meet sometime tomorrow and we could talk about doing this. I would love to have that conversation. Yep, sure. Uh, who are you? Ben Hutchings. What? Ben Hutchings. Oh, wow, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> it's awkward. 
So, <laughs> hi. Hi. Sorry to interrupt the awkwardness hey, and replace it with more awkwardness. Nice to see you, Jake. So, um, uh, I remember reading the, the documents in 2013 and seeing the NSA's internal training guide for how to query their Hadoop data store, aka XKeyscore. And so I uh, thought I would just ask you if you think free software net sort of helps us or helps them. Uh, I'm really glad you asked that question. I think that free software helps everyone on the planet. And I think that purpose-based limitations, well, I understand why people want them. Um, I think that we should try to build a world where we are free. And so putting in purpose-based limitations is really problematic. I think what we should do is try to mitigate the harm that they can do with those systems, as opposed to pretending that they care about free software licensing. These guys kill people with flying robots. It's illegal to murder people, and they do it. Limiting their use with licenses, first of all, that means they'll just spend your tax money to rewrite it if they care about the license and you won't get their bug fixes or their improvements. And then additionally, they're still not going to obey your license anyway because literally some of these people work on assassinating people. So it is better that we keep our integrity and take the high road and write free software and we give it to every single person on the planet without exception. It's just better. And it's better for all of us, right? So the same, the fact that they have Hadoop, the fact that they, for example, use OpenSSL, or maybe even if they use Tor, or whatever, right? Or they use GDB to debug their exploits. <laughs> I kind of wish that on them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great, right? So one of the things Che Guevara said in his manual about guerrilla warfare in chapter two is that, or no, it's chapter three. Uh, he talks about when you have to arm a guerrilla army, and this is sort of not exactly related, but kind of it's, it's an analog. Um, he says that the most important thing is for the guerrilla army to use the weapons of the people that they're fighting, the oppressor. And the reason is because it allows you to resupply, essentially. When you win a battle, you resupply. When we all use the same free software and we're working on these things, the fact that they have to contribute to the same projects, and they often do, means that there's a net win for us. Um, they do have some private things that they don't share, obviously, except with the exception of nice people like Edward Snowden. And I think that it is a net positive thing. And if we think about it as a struggle, we are better off to take the high road. And so I really think we should not pretend that we can stop them, and instead we should work together to build solutions. And I think that Debian is doing that, right? I think Debian is much harder to compromise than a lot of other operating systems, and it's much, much harder to coerce people, and I think that there's a strong ethos that comes with it. It's not just a technical project, there's a social aspect to it. I think I was in the new maintainer queue for like 11 years. Maybe, maybe that's a little too long, but you know, like there's a huge hazing process. Anyone who really wants to help really, really, really wants to help. And if they want to do something wrong, there are processes to catch people doing things wrong. So we should, we should really stay true to the free software ethos, and it really is a net benefit. Hello? Hi, Jake. Thanks a lot for saying so much, GSEC. Cheers. Cheers. Um, just wanted to uh, give a shout out. Uh, you mentioned um, possible backdoors in CPUs and so on, and that um, might not be the next best thing because it's not so open either. Uh, you might want to have a look at Power 8. It's basically Power PC 64, so Debian has support for it, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And most of the stuff is actually open. I mean, not the actual designs that IBM is using, but you can have actually uh, FPGA implementation of it, and yeah. you can actually, if you have the money, make hell your own ASICs for it without even knowing how to do it, which is pretty good, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, there are lots of things that we can hack, right? I had one of those like weird RMS laptops, the Limote or whatever it's called for a while, and I definitely was able to get some free software running on it. In theory, it was a free software laptop. But, you know, getting other people to use this is the problem. We need to get everybody to use it. Right? There's a sort of old anarchist cliche, none of us are free until all of us are free. And really, that, that really applies here. We, we really have to have free software that's usable by everyone. Otherwise, we're sort of bound down by the lowest common denominator, denominator of free 
or proprietary tools depending on what people have to use. So it'll be great when we have that. And there's a thing called the Milky Mist, which is a video mixing board that has an FPGA implementing a free software CPU that you can boot Debian on or OpenWRT, and it does work. And I have used it, and in fact, I used to use it as a, as a shell. And for a long time, I used to use a Debian trick that, actually, I've never talked about that in public. Let me think about that for a second. So I used to use an IRC client that was really buggy, and I couldn't figure out where all the bugs were, but I knew that if I hung out on certain networks that someone else would help me find those bugs um, by trying to exploit my client. And I wanted to make it as hard as possible, so I ran my IRC client instead of a Debian machine that was running an S390 emulator. And then I ran uh, on my S390, who here uses Hercules? Thank you to whoever packaged it. And uh, so I would use Hercules. It was a very long install process, um, <laughs> very slow. But then I would, and I would do this. And what I had sort of always dreamed of doing at some point was using the Milky Mist and Hercules together um, for maximum ridiculously difficult to exploit plus GRSec kernel. <laughs> um, but that's just not, I mean, it's not a usable thing. So what we need to do is take these kinds of prototypes, which actually do represent many steps forward, and we need to make sure that they're produced on a scale where you can go into a store and purchase them anonymously with cash in a way that you can then verify. And, and we're, really, we're actually very close to that with software-defined radios and with open hardware, but we just, we're, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, uh, what I meant is Power8 is basically getting big currently on the server market and it might get big for other stuff also. Hopefully. Um, I want to come back to the story about the uh, panic in the Apple Talk driver. Um, on two of my, or well, the, the common approach against this is compile your own kernel with all the stuff not compiled in. Yep. But um, of course. On, on two of my systems, I have a mod probe wrapper which has a whitelist of modules that may be loaded, and I install that wrapper as the thing that the kernel uses for loading modules. Mm -hmm. um, if, do you know that if this, such a thing exists elsewhere, or if not, maybe um, I, I would be interested in developing in, into something that is actually usable by other people? Or? Yeah, I think that would be, so that would be great. Um, in this case, it needs to be something, in this case we were using Tails, and so in, you know, Tails, Tails is very finicky about what it will accept. Um, and very reasonably so. And so having that V in Debian would make it a lot easier to get it into something like Tails, I think. Um, but the main thing is really, we have to think about the attack surface of the kernel very differently. The problem is not Apple Talk. The problem is the Linux kernel is filled with a lot of code and you can auto load in certain cases, certain things come in and certain things get auto loaded. And I mean, I know Bdale loves his ham radio stuff, but I never use ham radio on my machine I use for clandestine conspiracies, you know? Like that's a separate machine, it's over here. And so we just need to find a way to think about that. And part of that could be kernel stuff, but also part of it could be thinking about solutions like that where we don't need to change the kernel. So if you could package that and develop it, it would be really fantastic. Uh, actually, some time ago uh, after the, I think it was Econet exploits, no one uses Econet, it was broken in a way, but you could exploit it. Uh, because it was auto-loaded. Uh, so I actually went through and turned off a few of the, turned off auto-loading of a few of the more, more uh, obscure network protocols. And we could probably go further with that. But yeah, I think it'd be Even great. in the default. Yeah, I think uh, it'd be great to change some of the kernel stuff. So at least, I mean, Tails is a special use case where I think it's very important and it doesn't work for everyone, but we should just consider that there are certainly things which are really great and I wanna use Debian for it because Debian is a universal operating system. But then for like a modern desktop system where you're running GNOME and you, you know, haven't set anything up, it's Apple Talk, for example, it's just like maybe we would ask those people to load that module themselves. Um, yeah, uh, for example, you could have, um a lot of these things are going to have uh, uh, supporting utilities, so you can put something in the, in the supporting utilities that are uh, loaded at, at boot time. Yep. And if you don't have those installed, you don't, didn't need it. Yep, totally. And I think there's lots of ways to do it where the network can't trigger it, and that's important. Yeah, that's, that puzzles me. I can't, I can't understand. The, the protocol modules should get loaded um, when a user land opens a socket of that, tries to open a socket of that type. 
It shouldn't happen in response to uh, network traffic. Well, but I mean, I mean, that but there are things like I think ah, I think uh, if config, if you run if config, that can auto load a bunch of things, for okay. example. Yeah, I think on either side it should be more explicit, and I think the yeah, I mean, in this case with Tails. There was a time when you looked at the kernel module list and it was pretty amazing. You know, like I think there was like an X25 thing, an Apple Talk thing, and you're like, well, wait, this is all about going over Tor. We like don't support any of those things at all. Um, so it's just it's just kind of like the way that things are interdependent, right? So I mean, it's not a dig at the kernel itself. I think the Linux kernel, as it works in Debian today, works really well for a lot of people. But there is definitely a high security use case. And I, for example, if I were a Debian developer and I had a development machine where I didn't like run a web browser and I took a lot of uh, took a lot of effort, it'd be really nice if the kernel, if there was also a kernel that sort of put in the same. It was like the same sort of threshold of security. Um, and I think that a GRSec kernel with some stuff changed about it, like getting rid of Apple Talk and a few other things, would be closer to that. And combined with that guy's tool that he's talking about, you could make it lot uh, loadable modules that at least even if the system was going to auto load it, you could stop it in a sort of failing close kind of way. And I think there's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff proactively to do on that front. And there's, a, there's another project called Subgraph OS, which is basically working on becoming in some ways a Debian derivative. Um, and they're going to do stuff like GRSec kernel and they have a whole sandboxing framework which uses AppArmor, SecComp, and Expra, and a few other things. And I think that They'll make a lot of interesting security decisions, which might make sense to adopt in Debian later. Or, uh, I think Matthew Gar has some interesting criticisms of that and how it would re wouldn't really work. And Wayland was a better way to go than XPRA. But yeah, the, I've heard those criticisms, but Matthew Garrett is wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> not usually, but in this particular case, um, for example, the sandboxing stuff. I mean, if you have like a GNOME app store, essentially, that's for one set of users. But for like a Debian developer writing your own policies, it might be useful. And if you need Wayland, you might not have a full solution. We might want to have both for a while, for example. And I think it'd be great. And the main thing is just we need to find people who really think about those issues and try to integrate that. Because the security knowledge, pe most people who write exploits or that understand how to do offensive security stuff, they don't want to help free software projects. They just want to exploit them. And so some of the subgraph guys, one of the things that I really like about them is they're trying to improve the free software projects we all use. Even though they may make different design decisions, they're making free software all the same. So, um, so maybe also uh, something, other thing to keep in mind is actually um, that there's also a social aspect of um, all this um, pressure which push uh, NSA um, if NSA wants to push anything inside Debian. So if we actually also need to make sure that if they put pressure on somebody, um, we have any way to help these people not to actually uh, land in prison. So actually is there's also a social aspect mm -hmm. of, of uh, supporting people which get pressure from anyone. Yeah, if, I mean, if anyone is ever in that situation, one thing I would say is it's your right to stay silent. You have the right to remain silent, I think is the phrase the police would say. But there are definitely communities of people that will help you. There's a group called the Courage Foundation, for example, which was started by Sarah Harrison. And the job that the Courage Foundation has taken on is essentially to help people who would be sources or who are in harm's way like this. And if you found yourself in that kind of a position, there are people who will try to help you. I really don't think that that is the next step in this. I think that that could happen, but I think it's much more likely someone is gonna write an exploit for Firefox. That's the way they're gonna own Debian people in the future, for the most part. That's how they own us today, right? Firefox, number one enemy to security on your Debian machine, probably. And that's not a dig at Firefox, it's just super complicated software, and these guys are really good at writing exploits, and that's an easy target. So. We, I think, do need to deal with the social thing, but we also should look at some of the technical problems. And then when and if people have that, you can contact me. I'm super happy to try to put you in touch with people who will help. Um, and obviously, get a lawyer. Get a, several lawyers if you can. Probably contact the EFF or the ACLU, depending on where you are. But at least in Germany and in the United States and a few places, it isn't so bad yet that they can put that kind of pressure on you openly in a free software project. If you write proprietary software, 
you're in a very different situation. And there are definitely people who are in that situation right now, and I don't envy them, and their position is much harder. So actually writing free software already makes you not at the very beginning of that target list, I think. Any other questions? No? Wow, geez, this is keep, keep going. Where'd that run? Where's that run? Mm. So, uh, so yeah. It's okay. Yeah, a couple more. Um, it's, um, excuse me, how do you uh, deliver the encrypted message without exposing the connection to the third party? Um, could you, which encrypted message do you mean? Hmm? Do you mean like Jabber? Yeah, I mean like email or Jabber, yes. Yeah, so for the most part we use systems where Tor hidden services are available to connect to them, so we never even left the Tor anonymity network. So they're end-to-end -end encrypted and anonymized. You connect to a .onion address. Um, and then using crypto on top of that, so TLS to a Jabber server, and then OTR on top of that. So you sort of have this, um, you could call it a composition of different cryptographic systems. And the core of that is Tor, yeah. along with using throwaway machines, going to locations where you never go twice, mm. using open Wi-Fi plus Tor plus TLS plus OTR. Mm. And then for email, RiseUp offers Tor hidden services, which allows you to do the same thing essentially, and then using PGP as well. I mean, how about uh, metadata, like the, deliver, like the deliver, delivery address of the target? Yeah, so in, in the case of so, so for some of the, uh, uh, in some cases we use a system called Pond, and Pond is a system that is completely Tor hidden service based, P-O-N-D, pond.imperialviola.org. This is something I think Adam, Adam Langley probably wouldn't want me to say, but I'll say it anyway. It would be very useful to package this for Debian because it's a system where once you do a key exchange with someone, you have an end-to-end -end encrypted uh, messaging system that's like email, where you can send files that are encrypted, you can send messages that are encrypted, it's delay-based, you don't have usernames, you just have a public key, and then you have group signatures, so that people can send things to your mailbox by proving they're a member of the group, but not which member of the group they are. And there's a lot of stuff like that. So we use Jabber, we used email, and we use Pond. And those three systems together uh, also allowed us to build a clandestine sneaker net, so we have the ability to carry USB disks, and a few of us carried them inside of our bodies. And if you've never had that experience, lucky you. Um, um, <clears throat> you want to make sure you use post-quantum uh, computer crypto for that, by the way. Um, <clears throat> it's more comfortable. Should we relieve this man from his duties? Any other questions? Uh, otherwise, one more? One more question, and okay. then. OK. Um, so, when the Snowden leaks were first published, it created a lot of awareness and people were talking about it, and there was a huge media echo. Yep. Uh, if now some document is leaked, people are saying, yeah, there's all this surveillance and we aren't dead yet and we can still live our lives, and uh, mm -hmm. while they basically care less, they still care a bit, but they care much less than when the first documents were published. So, um, how can we maintain uh, awareness for this issue in the... Um, in the world population, in your opinion? Well, there is a really scary thing that's happening right now, which is we're sort of, there was this idea in the 90s, we had a, the crypto wars. Do any of you remember this idea of the crypto wars? Okay, a few of you do, not, maybe not all of you do, but we had the so-called crypto wars in the 90s. I encourage you to look this up on DuckDuckGo or whatever your favorite search engine is. And in theory, we're in the second crypto wars now. Uh, in reality, what happened is the first crypto wars never ended. We didn't actually win like we thought we did. Um, but there are a bunch of things that are taking place. So, for example, making a stand against backdoors, using end-to-end -end encrypted communications, actually pushing for that, being quite open about it, hosting those kinds of services, and doing it from a principled perspective, from a legal perspective. Um, I think that you will find that it will, the, the tension will continue to rise for a while, and I think that it will continue to be a, a, a conversation about public debate. And an important uh, aspect of this is that now regular journalists that don't understand technology at least understand the importance of these things. And if they don't do that, they at least perceive that they will be considered unprofessional if they don't care and think about those things. Um, or they'll be somehow negligent. And I think that will keep some of the discussion going and it will allow us to build some breathing room. And that breathing room will allow us to actually build some alternatives. But there 
are some downsides, right? Some of the things that take place when you reveal uh, security service spying is that it tends to get normalized to a degree. But then in some cases it does get pushed back. In the 70s in the United States, it became illegal to do assassinations, for example, because what the CIA was doing was so atrocious that eventually there was political pushback. It turns out it only lasted 30 years and then they started doing it again. But I mean, there's a saying in my country, which is that um, effectively the, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And that's what we are engaged in now. And the liberty starts with software liberty, I think, in the case of communications on networks. And so we have to have free software and it has to be responsibly uh, encoding packets and data. And I think that if we think about it in this sense, we'll find a lot of pressure and we'll have a lot of discussions about it. And you'll start to see it be a part of policy debates. Like one of the presidential candidates in the United States just came out against encryption. I hope that sinks his presidential campaign. I mean, it's weird to be against encryption. It's like, I'm against prime numbers. No <laughs> modular arithmetic. <laughs> But I, I, I just want to say, it's, it is important to understand, you are right, people will be normalized about it, but each and every one of us that understands these issues can actually keep it alive. And the way we do that is that when we communicate with people, we, I, I'll give you an example which I like to give. I grew up in San Francisco and in the Bay Area of San Francisco in California, and I did in that in the 80s. And so a lot of people that I knew had HIV and they died from AIDS. And there was a huge discussion about this. It was called GRID, the Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Syndrome, um, before it was called HIV and AIDS. And lots of people were sick and a lot of people died. And there was a sort of normalization process where people sort of accepted this as their fate, especially if they were in the gay community. And still, over years and years and years, people began to build a culture about safe sex and they started to talk about respecting their partners and about talking about these issues and getting tested. And it took a lot of effort to really go much further. And a lot of people actually died in that process. It was a very sad, serious situation. And I think we have similar discussions that are taking place now. And some people don't take it seriously. And if they happen to be Muslims living in Pakistan, they, they might get a drone strike. And there's a sort of survival mechanism that takes place there. And that's, uh, it's an unfortunate parallel, I think. But I would really consider that we can change this dialogue by continuing to have it even though it's exhausting and by recognizing our responsibility and how we can make it better by continuing to do that and by building healthy alternatives and by building new systems and by refusing to backdoor any system ever, completely committing to free software and to transparency of that software and also of those processes and really, really, really sharing the knowledge about it to make it impossible to suppress. And so we should not accept the normalization of that. We shouldn't make it fun to spy on people. We shouldn't make jokes about it in, in like a way that normalizes it. And we should respect those people who have been victims of surveillance. And we should recognize that basically everyone here is a victim of surveillance to some degree. And we should care about that. And we should continue to be upset, but not just be upset, but to channel that anger into something useful, like making Debian better. Thank you. Thanks, Jake, for such a long Q&A session. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rum. And uh, I'm sure... Jake's going to answer any more questions if he can still talk.